when was Jesus' greatest struggle? Or you could say, what was Jesus' greatest struggle? But what event, what moment in time was the most challenging for him? When, what did he most need to overcome? When was he most threatened with failure on his mission? That really is the core of my lesson today, but let's go to the Bible and read the scriptures and then we'll come back to that question. So, Matthew chapter 26, starting in verse 36. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane and he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter, Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away, unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come, and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Uh, Quite a long time ago, I read a quote uh, from the famous 19th century preacher Charles Spurgeon. And I'll read what he said. That famous prayer, Jesus' prayer in the garden, what a profound study it is for us. It ought properly to be called the Lord's Prayer. The manner and the matter are alike impressive. And I was impressed by this comment, and for a long time after that, I wanted to do a lesson on that topic. And since we've been walking steadily through John, and we've come up to this point, uh, last week Rob preached about Jesus' time in the garden, and Rob's not here, and I have the opportunity to preach this sermon, I thought I would take a little detour from our steady march toward the cross to dwell a little longer in the garden with Jesus and to look at the matter and the manner of the Lord's Prayer. Before we get into either of those uh, things, uh, let's give a little bit of context. And over the last, this is light context people, uh, not heavy context, uh, but over the last couple of years I've Realized how common the theme of the world saviour is in the movies. Now, when I explain this to you, you'll realise, if you haven't already, that people are always saving the world in the movies. Uh, Let's remember Sarah Connors. She saved us from Skynet in Terminator 1, and then Arnie came back and saved us all over again in Terminator 2. My favourite movie of all time, The Matrix. Keanu Reeves saves the world from The Matrix. But what you may have forgotten, uh, or many of you weren't even born to remember, was that he had already saved the world once before, ten years earlier, in Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. (laughs) Uh, Now, all of this has not gone gone unnoticed by the movie buffs. In fact, there's a top ten list of the greatest world-saving actors in Hollywood history. And for those who are interested, here we go. Arnie comes in a distant sixth with a, me- with a measly seven rescues of the world. Uh, Keanu Reeves is number three with nine world-saving adventures. But at the top, the oldies, drumroll please, is Sean Connery with no less than 12 successful globe-saving episodes. Uh, so... Um, There you go. Now, of course, the risk with all this, and I think the risk for us all all the time, is to Hollywoodize the world. Now, I love a lot of those movies, uh, but let's be careful to keep uh, reality real and Hollywood separate. So, let's get back to the reality. Let's talk about Jesus' day uh, in the first century. And he's praying in this garden called Gethsemane. It's got a name. 
That's not, that's not the word that means garden. In fact, we learned last week, Gethsemane means in Aramaic, oil press. Uh, the city of Jerusalem had a large population for its size. That was the first issue. And there really wasn't any room for gardens. Now remember, gardens weren't there to look pretty. They were there to grow produce to live by. I'm sure they may have had flowers as well, but um, principally it was a subsistence life. You lived on what you produced. So these, were, uh, these market gardens were the subsistence for, for the city. Uh, the second thing was because it was the holy city, you, there was a law forbidding the use of manure. You couldn't bring any droppings into the city to fertilise the garden. And of course, the, if you've seen pictures of, of uh, Israel around Jerusalem, it's not exactly a, a, um, a rainforest fertile place. And so you needed to pr- provide some kind of fertiliser to grow things. And so all the gardens were outside in this, in, uh, around the city and one of them was called Gethsemane. It's called uh, the, um, the oil press. And whoever owned it had allowed Jesus and his disciples to use it for whatever purposes they were, uh, having discipling groups and obviously to pray. Uh, and so here we are with Jesus and the, the uh, um, 11 remaining apostles um, at this episode, which is only hours away from saving the world. Well, what would a Hollywood film crew, what would a, what would a crew from um, uh, Universal Studios have seen if they'd been there with their cameras and their microphones with a little dead cat on the end? That's what they call that furry thing, by the way. I think they would have been very disappointed. There would have been um, 12 people there uh, dressed in ordinary clothes. Um, 11 of them were sleeping. And one of them was praying. Not exactly Schwarzenegger in full combat mode. Now, to grasp what was happening, to get the properly epic tone of this event, you'd need some kind of spiritual night vision goggles, which of course nobody has, but then you would see the great contest. And in fact, that's the less name of the sermon today is the great contest. Okay. And I'm going to point out a couple of things that you would need to see. And of course, you, we can only see these things in retrospect. You can only understand these things because uh, we have um, the story, not because we have the, the video. Uh, what you would see is, first of all, the stakes that Jesus was playing for here, if playing is not uh, an incorrect word. It was not just the rescue of, of humanity from a rogue asteroid. This was the rescue of humans, each individual, from his or her own sin for eternity. The second thing we need to see is the enemy. And in all of Jesus' ministry, there are only two times recorded when angels helped him. And one was after being tempted by Satan in the wilderness. Uh, And at the time, the scripture says, the devil left Jesus until a more opportune time. What does that mean? It means a time when he had a chance of taking him down, of fouling him up. And this is it. He knows absolutely what's going to happen in a few hours. This is the time. In the garden, Jesus was at his weakest. And I don't think it's a coincidence that at the end of his prayers, the scripture says, an angel strengthened him. Um, The spiritual night vision goggles would also show us Satan throwing all his power into defeating Jesus. And I don't think in the way Mel Gibson had it with some creepy, pasty-faced person wandering around with a hood and, and, and uh, and whispering. This is a spiritual attack. This is an internal attack on Jesus' thoughts, on his will, on his faith, on his heart. And the third thing we would need to see with our spiritual uh, night vision goggles is the cost of the battle. Uh, so let's not forget that the, the cross was not a simple execution like, say, um, a firing squad. It was a protracted torture, not just designed to get rid of the, uh, the criminals, but to instill terror in the population so they didn't do anything like that again. It was a propaganda exercise. 
It was an advertising of don't mess with us. Um, and that's to say nothing of the spiritual horrors that Jesus was to face after wearing the sin of the world. Now, if you take all these things together, you take the stakes that Jesus was playing for, the power of the enemy and the cost of the battle, I think it's pretty easy to see why Jesus said that his heart was overwhelmed with sorrow. Uh, and um, a, a parallel account says that he was in anguish. Now, that word, anguish, um, comes from this Greek word. I, I don't, uh, this doesn't have a little shooter on it. Uh, the word is argon. Uh, originally, it's a, it's a funny word, it began meaning an assembly. Uh, and then it came by steps to mean, so assemblies such as watching the Olympic Games, which is uh, Olympiakoi Agonis. That's the, that's the Greek uh, name for the Olympic Games. So originally it was an assembly watching the Games, and then uh, it began to be, it, there was then the, the meaning transferred across to uh, the Games themselves that event. And then it shifted again to come to mean the crisis or the stress or the emotion of the athletes competing in those games. So we can see the drift of meaning and eventually we get the English word agony from that, from that Greek word. And this is the context of the Lord's Prayer. The stakes. Get out of Hollywood. Here they are really resting on his shoulders alone. And he can't mess up. He cannot slip. He can't put one foot wrong. He is not then a perfect sacrifice. No matter what he does, the, the, it's, it's over. Now, for those who are spiritually minded, for those of you who uh, either, uh, have had the privilege to view the world, not from the point of view of ordinariness, but through spiritual eyes, it is very easy to think that Calvary, that's, that's the place where Jesus was crucified, was the location where uh, Jesus triumphed over Satan. But many theolog theologians comment that it was actually here in the garden um, that the real victory was won, and I tend to agree with them. And, and if anything, this is the, the core to me of this lesson. As we review this, I think it's worthwhile remembering that the name of Gethsemane was the oil press. When Jesus walked in the garden that night, he was crushed with sorrow. He was overwhelmed with pressure and the stakes and the, and the cost and the pain that was coming. And uh, in Hebrews chapter 5, you don't have to turn there, I've, I've written it up here for us. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Though he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. I, I believe that during this prayer, during this time in the oil press, that any remnants of Jesus' selfness got squeezed out. When Jesus walked out of the garden in the early dawn hours with his captors, he walked out perfected. He walked out the pure, sacrificial lamb ready to die. And so my second point is the place of victory. This experience thing, and especially the prayer by which Jesus was sustained through it, I think deserves special attention from Christians because it's the model on which our efforts to be like our master should be based. And I think there's three things that we can take from uh, Jesus' prayer that night. Doubtless there are more, but I just want to cover these three which stand out. So in verse 41, Jesus tells the disciples, watch and pray so that you won't fall into temptation. Now, it's not the only time in Jesus' ministry where he says such a thing, watch and pray, numerous times. But my first point, uh, sub-point, practically, if you like, is watching and praying. But what is watching? Uh, this bothered me for... I didn't have a crisis about it, but it, it was one of the things... What does he mean, watching? Um, 
He was not watching for the Roman guards. He wasn't watching for the groundskeeper to come and kick him out of the garden. Um, But we get a clue in verse 40 where Jesus goes back to the disciples. They're sleeping and he says, Could you men not keep watch with me for one hour? In other words, what he'd been doing was watching. And we know it it wasn't um, people coming to get him. They were going to come. There was no question about that. But what he was doing in prayer was watching. And and so what was he watching? Well, as we've said, not looking around for danger or wild animals uh, or whatever, but watching his inner world, watching his own universe, his heart and his thoughts, and checking his will and checking his motives for signs of slippage or error or weakness. And note how these two things go together. As we pray, we must examine ourselves. And what we find from that examination becomes fuel for our prayers. So we look within and we pray within and God, and our, our, like an onion, to use a cliche, that peels back and we see new layers in who we are and what we're thinking and what our motives are. And then we pray about that. And then the new level opens up. And we pray about that and a new level opens up. That's the first one. Praying and watching go together. Um, in verse 44 of Luke, and being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. So my second uh, practical, if you like, I think that I really believe, don't just, don't just see Jesus doing, but believe we must do if we're going to progress, if we're going to be like the master, because that's what a disciple is. We are students under the master trying to be like the master. Um, we need to pray earnestly. Now we've already, he prayed, was, he was in anguish. And uh, we've already covered this word. That comes from that Greek word, agonia. Uh, but what we need to look at is Jesus' response to this agony. This response to this anguish. And what does the Bible say? He prayed more earnestly. Uh, that's a pretty crucial thing. Let's, let's think about that for a minute. What happens, and I'm talking to people who are Christians, what happens to your prayer life when the pressure increases? Especially when the pressure increases because you are following God. That really is the crucial time, the cross, if you like. Um, We either pray less because to pray means that we have to go and talk to the God who is aware of all this and allowing us to go through all this, or we pray more, which of course is what Jesus did. In some ways, this is the make or break point of a spiritual life. The response to crises when we suffer, when we doubt, when we can't see the way forward, do we press closer to God or do we pull away? But Jesus prayed more earnestly. And the third thing, the next feature of Jesus' prayer in the garden was, was repetition. He goes away in grief and anguish and he prays for an hour and then he comes back to the disciples. Why did he go back to the disciples? Now, I'm, this is pure speculation, but I think it's plausible. I get the impression that he was feeling better. He was feeling strengthened. He was feeling encouraged. He gets up. He has space in his heart to think about others. He has space in his heart to, to, to not hold on to his father for dear life. And he goes back and he, and he sees how they're going and they're all asleep, has a little chat with them. I suspect that as he's talking, the dread starts to come back. And the awareness of what is going to happen starts to come back. And he thought he was resolved, but he wasn't. And I don't know whether he... Uh, I don't know exactly whether that happened but it's certainly the case for me that I think I've prayed through something I think I'm resolved I think I've forgiven that person or moved on I'm fine and then I find actually I'm not fine actually uh, but it was but it was clear to me why is it not clear anymore I was resolved really was resolved but maybe I really wasn't see victory it takes perseverance and it takes repetition and certainly it took Jesus three times before he was ready to leave the garden under arrest but at peace. And the fourth and final aspect of Jesus' prayer, and I think the hardest, to be honest, if that wasn't challenging enough, 
was submission. Uh, this wasn't his submission to his father's will was not a mere resignation. The attitude of a defeated man with no energy left to struggle, just giving in to the inevitable. And I don't think it was the submission of bitterness, the attitude of a captured man who was completely overwhelmed and had no choice but to obey externally. It was the submission of trust. It was the attitude of a child who says, Daddy, you can do anything. Please let me go. Please let me go. But I'll accept whatever you say. Now, how rare and how difficult it is to have an attitude like that. So in all of this, I see one more thing, if you like, one fifth theme, and it encompasses all the others. And we see it back in Hebrews 5, which I had up before. Though he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered, and once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Jesus learned obedience. He learned. That means he didn't have it at the beginning. Now, he was sinless. I think we need to be clear about this. But he was not ready to be the perfect sacrifice until he had learned all that was necessary. In other words, he had to grow just as we had to grow and to learn the spiritual lessons just as we have to learn them. And in this, I include the skills and the lessons of praying. Jesus was tempted in every way, just as we are. He had to learn prayer just as we do. Let me uh, give you a situation uh, to illustrate this. When Jesus was 12 years old and, he, and, he, and his parents went back home and, and to Bethlehem, presumably, wherever it was, and he was um, left in the temple talking to the elders and learning from them and amazing them with his wisdom, he was sin-free. But he was not ready to go to the cross at that time. He had to be prepared for it through the training in all the same disciplines disciplines that we have also got to practice in the watching and the praying and the scripture reading and the patience and the discipline and all the things we see over the next um, 20 years that he has Uh, accomplished, that he has mastered. Uh, Going back to modern fame, Serena Williams has won 39 Grand Slam titles, 23 single ones, and and the rest uh, doubles and mixed, uh, and four Olympic gold medals. And her comment about success is really telling, I think. Luck has nothing to do with it. Because I have spent many, many hours, countless hours, on the court, working for my one moment in time, not knowing when it would come. And there's a Latin motto, uh, the, the Romans spoke Latin, I guess it's appropriate, but, uh, which summarises this. Amat victoria curam, or victory loves preparation. And as it was with Serena Williams and all the Olympic stars, so it was with Jesus. And also, of course, so it must be with us. Victory in spiritual matters is not a matter of luck. Or even of gifts. Think about it. Who had more gifts than Jesus? But it was about preparation. It was about practice. It was about repetition. It was about training. Now, all things are possible with God. As Jesus many times tells us. But we must press on to take hold of these things by effort in prayer. Last point. The spoils of victory. Remember this, the the title of the sermon is The Great Contest. Well, at the end of this contest, there better be something good. (laughs) There better be a victory if we stick it out to the end. For Jesus... Although the battle was with himself, and I accept that Satan was tempting him and so on, and and Judas was betraying him, and the the Jewish leaders were were completely corrupt, etc., etc., etc. So we could say the battle was not within himself, but they put the pressure on and he had to deal with it. 
But the battle was not ultimately for himself. He was winning a vi- victory for others. He was winning a victory for us. Yeah? And in doing so, he did two things. He guaranteed us a victory as long as we take hold of it. And he set a pattern for us to follow in our own battles, our own great contests, in our own agony. Uh, In this, we need to be aware that the victory of prayer must not be defined as just getting everything we request. I'll say it again. The victory in prayer is not getting everything we request. And, of course, there's whole books you could write about that, but... Jesus, I mean, think about it. Jesus didn't get everything he requested, so why should we? It's foolish to, to, to argue otherwise. In fact, the victory consists, the real victory, the spiritual victory, the deep victory, the great victory, comes in getting the strength to face whatever we must face. And if this seems like a poor consolation prize, then let's consider the spoils of victory. To be victorious in prayer means to win the peace of your conscience. To be victorious in prayer means to be more effective uh, in... It's to have more effective answer to our requests, even if we don't get them all. Uh, The victory in prayer ultimately brings the the peace and the strengthening given by the Holy Spirit through which we gain the salvation of ourselves and the salvation of others. Now... They are maybe the big picture items. Let's talk about some of the, the smaller items, if you like. No, but no, no less important when we get them. If you have suffered the loss of a cherished dream, some great um, hurt to your heart, God is no doubt planning to use that experience to send you to people in similar circumstances in order to teach them and comfort them and save them at some point you don't know about. So you've sacrificed sleep, you have sacrificed health, jobs, relationships for the kingdom. It has not gone unnoticed. And and it will not remain unused for some purpose that you do not yet see or understand. There are many other things, quite unexpected things, that God does for his faithful ones, sometimes just for our encouragement, pleasure and enjoyment. In conclusion... Uh, Since October last year, we've been following John's account of Jesus' life. And from from his birth uh, through to this moment where we are in the garden, and we only have a few weeks to go, and the great epic will be over. But we are now, in this story, on the threshold of the final act. The, The great contest between good and evil. That singular event when the world really was saved, or at least the whole world was really offered salvation. And as we read, we ought to be deeply impressed by the purity and the perfection of Jesus' response to the pressures he faced, by the clarity and strength with which he rose to face the cross. But it's a mistake if we leave it as a kind of spiritual cinema. It is history, but it's also instruction for us. The gospel accounts are for our wonderment, but also for our betterment. Uh, The Lord's victories at the oil press of Gethsemane and then at the cross handed us a victory that we could not attain. But we have our role to play now in this contest. And that role can't be better played than by imitating the master. By both the matter and the manner of his prayers, watching and praying repeatedly, earnestly and humbly until we too can face our personal crosses with his clarity and purity and strength.